It's not, it's not a, a mystery in that sense. It's pretty clear. So one and know as well. Learn his teachings, right? You're like, gosh. I mean, it's a very simple one. Love your neighbor, right? Pretty simple one. You're like, I just don't know if it's God's will whether or not I swindle my neighbor. Guess what? It's not God's will that you swindle your neighbor. What's God's right? will is that you love your neighbor. It's right there. It's pretty easy. Right? Isn't that how it works? How's the, how's the easiest way for me to cheat? It's not, it doesn't matter. It's not about that. Look at what's God's will. All right, here you go. All right, so learning is teaching. So let's open up our Bible's book of Romans. We're going to watch right here. And I love this because right starting out, he just hits straight into to doctrine, to theology right at the beginning. He says, this letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised his good news long ago through the prophets and the holy scriptures. The good news is about his son, uh, in his early life, he was born in King David's family line, and, his, and he was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Christ our Lord. And just in that nugget, he says so much. He gives you a clue about what the Bible, what this whole book's going to be about. First of all, it's going to be about you guys, us. He's going to use himself slightly as an example. So understand, when he says the meteorological things about you guys, he's standing about him too. But when he says all the great, amazing things about him being saved, he's standing about us as well. We are called out. He was called out. Not because of anything that he did. He doesn't say, I'm a good guy, I set myself apart. We watch the Olympics, right? And what do they do? They have a qualifier round where somebody comes down, and those who are really fast, they're in the front, and they're, woo, and then they set themselves apart. That's not how Paul works. That's not what Paul said. Paul said he, God reached into the world, grabbed us knuckleheads, and pulled us. And it's not like there's a first class section and a coach. We all got pulled in. And that's what he's saying here. So he starts out saying that we're all set apart. And then he goes straight into theology about Jesus Christ. He says he was born physically, right? Born of the lineage and house of David. But he was also shown to be God's son by being raised from the dead. So is Jesus divine? Absolutely. 100%. Is he human? Absolutely. He was born 100%. As a human, he could be our sacrifice. He could, be, he could pay for our price. But as God, he was able to actually do it. He had the ability to do it in a way that we could not. And these, these are important lessons. As, as we start, start into this, this is important to see. And all of these truths are important because guess what? If we don't base everything, and like he said, what did he say? He said, as the prophet said, he's pointing us back to Scripture. He's pointing us back to the truth that God will. We as humans can want our we can we can want all sorts of things. Like Super Mario Brothers. We can want Super Mario Brothers. We can want whatever our wonders can be pointing in all sorts of directions. Woohoo! Go Super Mario! Yes. <laughs> but just because we want Super Mario doesn't mean that Super Mario is necessarily good for us. Wah. Right? <laughs> our desires, our desires can be pointing every direction. We have to have something that we, we, so coming back to the very beginning, we have to check our desires. Now, as a chaplain, I used to teach, I used to teach a very basic thing, and this was to Marines, so this was. I'm not saying it was basic because it was two minutes, but it's because it's the first level of thought. It's the first level of thought that I teach my kids to. What is it? I talk about your thinker and your feel. Oh, I mean, and I try to get people to make decisions not on their feeler, but on their thinker. Because the first level, the first level of that is to be able to look and do long-term planning. 
The challenge with the feelings isn't that the feelings are necessarily bad. Feelings, we can say faith, feelings, we can say desires, we can say all these things. Somebody can be desire, can desire to be married. Is that a good thing? That can be a good thing. Somebody can desire to have kids. Is that a good thing? It can be a good thing. Yay. Well, kids are always a good thing. But the way that we do it can be in the wrong season or the right season. There's all these... So, so our, desire, our desire doesn't necessarily tell us whether or not it's right. It just tells us that we want it. And that's what I would be doing. Is I try to get people to, to think out of the... Move from the, the feeler, move to the thinker. But now the next level of teaching is this. Your thinker can be diabolical. What? Diabolical, I mean bad. That means pointing to the devil. That's, ah! what, it is. That's what its root is. At. Punch it. We can point. Our, our thinker has the ability to do good things and amazing. We can build cathedrals and we can build gas chambers to gas six million Jews. And it's the same thinker. So just because we have a thing, just because we've moved from the feeler to the thinker, doesn't mean we've necessarily gone good, but it's the first level. Then what we do is with the doctrine, with teaching God's truth, then we inform this, and then our will hopefully gets informed and starts pointing that direction. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm hitting the doctrine today, but I, I'm good okay. All right, so through Christ Jesus, God has given us the privilege and the authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere uh, what God has done for them so that they believe and obey and bringing glory to his name. Let me pause for a second. A lot of times when I've read this before, I started reading it wrongly. And I think that when he's saying us, apostles, he means the big 12 plus him. But when he means us apostles, he means all of us who are called out. So guess what that means you guys are? Apostles. apostles. Really, it breaks down into this. You are either damned or an apostle. As you go to be saved, boom, this is your commission. Go from this to this. So when he's saying that you are given the privilege to, to give the message out there, he is talking to us. Hey, that's all of us. But I didn't have the training. Well, here's the training. Yeah. Wherever, I don't know where I could possibly learn. From here, from other believers, we, we, we learn together. That's, we encourage, we build up one another. So really, that we are all called as apostles. You're sent. You've been called out from the world, just like Paul was. As a murderer, that's what Paul was. Paul was a murderer. He was persecuting the church. He was called out as a murderer, and we too have been called out. We were murderers. We were adulterers. We were, we were thieves. We were liars. We were, uh, we were whatever the deal is. We were pulled in. God called us out. He, re he made us holy, and then sent us out as apostles. And you are included among those Gentiles who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. I am writing to you in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his own holy people. God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because of your faith in him. It's your faith in him that unifies us, Father. We'll get to that. It's being talked about and all over the world. God knows how often I pray for you day and night, and I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all my heart, by spreading the good news about his son. See, listen, when, it, when the Bible says saints, he's not talking about the Christians that sit in that first class section on the airplane. When the Bible says saints, it means everybody that's called out. Have you been called out? When the Bible says saints, that's you. What we have is if you're called out, God called you out, promoted you, congratulations, your apostles, your saints. We are unified in Christ. There's not like a, like a distinguished section in heaven. We're all called out. That's good news. And you can turn around and say, but I have this sin, or I've done this, or I've done this. It doesn't matter. 
The book of Romans sh shakes that all out really soon. So let's keep pushing. Uh, yes, we're called out by God. We are united, united by faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the things I, I always pray is for the opportunity, God willing, to come to see you, uh, to, to come at last to see you. For I long to visit, I'm sorry, for I long to visit you so I can bring you some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord. When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. Now, let me pause for a second. Um, maybe I'm too critical. Maybe I'm too critical. I, I recognize it. So often, I hear teachers, and this is, I've heard teachers in my life say, you're the best class I've ever had. Have you ever heard that? Right? Or they've said, and then and the same, and this is the same place where they will say something. I've learned as much from me, from you guys, as you've learned from me. And sometimes you roll your eyes and you're like, you don't even know my name, right? <laughs> Have you known that? Okay. Understand when Paul is saying this, this is more than platitudes. He's not saying, I want to be there so that I can encourage you and you can encourage me, because he really means so that I can encourage you and you can listen. Because Paul, this is the same Paul, by the way, who in Corinthians, what does he describe the church? He says we're all members of the same body. We all, Our jobs are all important to one another. What would it be like if it was all the ear or the eye or the, the nose or no, I'm inserting? But the same thing, any body part. He makes, he makes the picture of, of the, when he says the less honorable, he means kind of the parts that you don't show people. That's what he means. He's talking about the whole thing. Like the yes. beauty tea? Yes. The the beauty tea. tea. He means all of it. All of it. That's up. He means all of it is important. The whole body is needed. So when he's coming and saying, hey, I want to get to Rome not only so that I can help encourage you like I do, what I do, but I want to get ministered to by you. Folks, that's what we do. We minister to one another. It's important. This is a, a teaching here. Then continuing on. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to visit you. But I was prevented until now. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit, just as I've seen among other Gentiles. For I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and the uneducated. See, Rome was kind of like... The, the end all be all of everything at this point in the world. And he's like, yeah, I'd love to be there. I'd love to be there. I'd love to be everywhere. I have an obligation to, I feel a, obliged to help these. I love, well, I, I love a lot of things. I love the fact that Paul here is illustrating the truth about Christian leadership, which is really his, although he's a leader, he's obligated. He feels, my job is to serve the people that I, I'm called to be responsible for. And it's a, that's a big thing. This upside down leadership that he's doing here, this is different than the way the world goes. And whether or not we're talking about the upside down leadership here, or whether or not he's talking about the importance of every person in the, in the body, all of these are truths that are taught in the Bible. And they run counter to the way the rest of the world sees things. They run counter to the way the rest of the world sees things. So we, as People called out from the world see things originally the way the rest of the world does, which is people are either important to me because they make me feel better or make me feel not better, or they're important to me because they're useful to me. That's how a lot of people see things. That's how I see things sometimes. That's how the flesh sees things. So what I do is as I read the Bible, and the Bible says every person's important, well then if the Bible's truth is that every person's important, whether or not I think they're stinky or not, it doesn't matter. The Bible's truth supersedes what the world has taught me. If I think this one guy is really important because they're whatever, they're, they're holding this office, they're the President of the United States, they're the head of the NFL, or the whatever, whatever place of authority that I can say, oh, that guy is more important than, no, he's not. This person right here that's homeless, they're important too. They're all important. God sees them all as important. That if, if that's the truth I believe, then it changes the way I live. Right? I hope so. 
So I'm eager to come to you in Rome uh, to preach the good news. For I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in His sight. Uh, this is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through uh, faith a righteous person has life. Boy, this is, by the way, this is going to be his theme throughout everything. Righteousness through faith. If you go to a, a school, if you go to a university, if you go to a secular university, if you go to some Christian universities, they're going to tell you that Paul was a revolutionary. And they're going to say that Paul taught this new thing called faith, uh, faith in Jesus, and then essentially he changed the way the world was. But guess what? Paul right here is not quoting Paul. Paul is quoting a prophet by the name of Habakkuk, who 600 years earlier says these things. Paul is quoting God, saying, hey, this is how it works. Not really a revolutionary. He's not reforming anything. He's saying he's just giving a clear argument. But, what we have here is we have a picture of what Christianity, and it's, and it's, it's a way that is different than the rest of the world. Um, we Christians are weird. Mm -hmm. We need to accept it. Okay. We need to accept that we're different than the rest of the world. There are ways that we see things... I hope there are ways that we see things that are the result of our new programming as we come in and look. Now, I'm going to. It would be really easy for this to sound political, and I don't mean it to. So, please let's step away from it as much as. The Omarosas of the world, the, the, the Joy Bayards of the world, who are concerned that a vice president can hear from Jesus. Okay. It would be very easy for me to feel offended that what was said about him and him having mental illnesses because he hears from Jesus is offensive of me because I believe I hear from Jesus also. It would be easy for me to get offended like that. It would be easy for me to say that somebody is attacking me and to see them as the enemy. But here's the truth. The truth is it's a testimony that the Amorosas and the Joy Behars of the world are in dire need of knowing that Jesus can talk to them. What about the small, still voice? That's, that's it. I'm growing up with that. The reality, the reality... The reality is absolutely, absolutely. The, 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 the thing isn't that when I look at that, I go, oh, the society is attacking Christians. It's not that. It's the society showing that they've never heard from Jesus or they're not recognizing Jesus' voice. That doesn't mean that we need to huddle together and go, oh, they're attacking us. It means that these people are the broken people that need to get the message. They're not the enemy. They're the battleground. They're not the enemy. They're the battleground. Yeah, I think we said, did we say, what was that, three weeks ago? What was, what was, was that four, four weeks ago, maybe? It might have been, but we were there. Yes, absolutely. Now, I think you quoted that in a prayer recently, didn't you? Uh -huh. Absolutely. By the way, that's what the, Roman, the book of Romans are. Book of Romans is about that. Hey, by the way, the sick need the physician. But the rest of the book of Romans is, you're all sick. <laughs> by the way. That's the other part, Ben. And so are we. And so are we. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sick. Yeah, we're all sick. And so here you go. So here's the deal. Christianity is different from the rest of the world in this. The way that the rest of the world works, just like poor Martin Luther was trying to do, where he was really working hard to make himself clean, and he realized he couldn't because... He didn't have it in him. The rest of the world, and when Paul's writing this to Gentile religions, the way that you do it in Gentile religions, was, or the, the religions of Rome at that time, is that let's say you did something bad, right? Something stinky in your life. 
Well, what you did is you tried to do some good things to make up for it. Essentially, you just keep spraying Axe body spray all over your nasty B.O. It's like the boys' high school locker room, right? No, it doesn't work that way. It's even more disgusting. Right? Isn't that how the rest of the world works? If I just keep doing good deeds, I'll not be nasty. So other, every other religion works from that idea. That there is some way that you can do some, some good deeds to cover up this. Christianity works differently in that it says that it's Jesus, or that it's God, makes us right. God makes us right. We don't make us right. God makes us right. Jesus died on the cross for us to cleanse us. The cleansing doesn't come from us, from our activities, from our doing things to pay for our own sin. Jesus did. It's external to us. It becomes internal to us and transforms us. It's an amazing truth. But God shows... Oh. So now we come to this. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, uh, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God has made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Boy, that's a big one. Now, on your, in your worship bulletins, I have, over the last four weeks, I've been putting a little, one of those little proofs of God, like little arguments about, hey, this is how you can know there's a God, there's a God, there's a God. If you think that these are amazing, guess what? They're, they didn't all originate from Christianity. Some of these have at their heart Aristotle and Plato. Were they Christians? Did they have access to the Bible? No. Maybe not. They were learned men. They were learned men. The What's that? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. Potentially, the thing is, it predated uh, it predated the Septuagint. Septuagint is when they translated it to Greek. But these guys, all they, they make arguments for God based off of what they see in the world. That's the, I see design. It suggests a designer. I know I feel shame. Shame doesn't make any sense. Why should I feel shame? I feel shame because I have an idea that there's a good that I'm not able to maintain. All of these things, they reasoned out. They were able to reason out. That's what it's talking about here. Is that if you look, they could see something. Of course, we get uh, held accountable to that. So I call it the faith of not yet believing. This is uh, from from Roman, uh, sorry, from Psalms 19. Uh, Psalms 19 goes: The heavens declare the glory of God; the earth proclaim the work of His hands. The idea that if you look out there, you're going to see some, you're going to see evidences of God. Yes, they knew that uh, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship Him. You like that? They wouldn't worship Him. They recognize something. They wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. They began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people or birds or animals or reptiles. Hey, this is a temptation that we all can have. We have a tendency of turning... Creating God in our image. The idea is we have, we're looking for a truth beyond what we know, and then we conform our knowledge to what they say. Because otherwise, I'm going to make God to be somebody that does things, you know, his will is really going to be just a reflection of my desire. Folks, that's diabolical. My desires aren't always good. I need to reform my desires. The worst thing in the world is a, spo a spoiled child, right? As an adult, I can be that spoiled child. If I keep feeding my, my desires, I can be just as bad as that spoiled child. My heart can be just as cruel a devil as any. So I have to reform it. 
So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their heart desired. As a result, uh, they did violent, degrading things to each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie so that they worshiped and served the things of God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. So right here he's saying that they, they turned it into a created being. But while I can look at it and say, oh, those folks that don't know about God, they feel that way. But you know what? Believers can do the same thing. When we fail to learn, when we fail to study the Bible, when we fail to learn about God, then very quickly we see God is doing whatever we want to, you know. I'm an American. I'm a patriot. I want to say Jesus is an American and patriot. Is that true? No. Well, yes, but no. he's also a Roman and he's also other stuff. He's other stuff. Very good. So we have to look and we have to check and we have to check ourselves. And I would love it if God wants all the things that I want, but that's not how it works. That is why God abandoned them into their shim, uh, uh, shameful desires. Even the women turned against their natural ways to have sex uh, and instead indulged uh, in sex with each other. And then men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women burned with lust for each other. Men did uh, shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffer within themselves the penalty they deserve. And here's the thing. A lot of folks get nervous, especially now, when we talk anything about homosexuality. But here's, here's what I just want to show. What they're showing here is homosexuality is they're, they're showing it as an outgrowth of hedonism. Because the reality is, if it feels good, if I'm doing it because it feels good, it's really me that I care about, not anybody else. And right here, so I'll have people that say, does the Bible say anything about homosexuality? Yes, it does. But here's the deal. I don't stop the, trip, the teaching here. Because hedonism doesn't say, well, just hedonism leads to homosexuality. Yes, it does. But it goes way past it. Because here's the rest of it. So first of all, when we... It's confusing. Yeah, we'll, we'll get. Uh, since they thought it uh, foolish to acknowledge God, He abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. They lived their lives uh, full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and folks. What's gossip? Gossip is talking about people. Oh, gossip! Yeah. Not a good talk. It's not a good talk. Do people gossip? Yes. Okay, so when people say, is homosexuality a, a list of sins? Is it on a list of sins? I will always say, what will I say? Yes. Because there it is, right there. I'm just talking about homosexuality. But here's the deal. Was that the only thing on the list? No. Now here's, here's our problem. As believers, if, if statistics are to be True, less than 2% of our culture struggles with homosexuality. So it's really easy for me to talk about a sin that 98% of us don't struggle with. And we can go, oh, those knuckleheads, oh, those other 2%. But, gossip? And I'll tell you, more churches have been destroyed by gossip. All right, so here's the deal. We got we to, gotta, as believers, we got to stop doing this. Oh, let me do it this way. I'm going to continue because he, he doesn't stop here. He says, so really quick, we were getting led up. Uh, Paul's leading us right down the path because he's, he starts talking about all these bad things. Are those bad things? He's talking about Adolf Hitler. Should Adolf Hitler go to hell? Who's Adolf Hitler? Oh, yes. Why are we doing public school? Okay, um, Adolf Hitler was the guy who read uh, one uh, that was in charge of uh, the, the German Nazis during World War II. Oh. He had, he had a solution yeah. to his world problems. He decided to kill about 6 million Jews and other people he found undesirable. Go to hell, go to hell, go to hell. So you think, yes. So people, people say Adolf Hitler, and they're like, yeah, he should go to hell. That's what, what Paul's doing. He's winding them up. What about people that steal stuff? Should they go to hell? Nah. What about people that murder stuff? Not if they change. What about people that that's what they start saying all these things? And then here he goes. 
They are backsliders, haters of God, insolent and proud and boastful. They invented new ways of sinning and they disobeyed their parents. <laughs> they refuse to understand, breaking their promises, and are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Yet worse, they encourage others to do them. And right here, everybody's like, yeah, I can think of all those bad guys out there, right? Those bad guys, those bad guys. We're all thinking that, right? Paul's setting us up. Paul's setting us up. So here's the wind up. Those bad guys, we're talking about them, right? Those people. Them, them. What do you mean by those people? Well, here you go. You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad. And you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do the very same things. Folks, this is one of those that you're like, oh, that's right. It sings us, right? Now, coming back. It's easy for us to talk about this as a lesson that applies to people that aren't believers, but this applies to us. And here's some things, by the way. Some things, as believers, we got to stop doing. we got to stop doing kind of that, well, what feels right to you? Do what you think is right. I don't care what you think is right. Look to find out what is right. It makes me crazy when I go to a Bible study, and at the end of a Bible study, the first thing they say is, well, how do you feel about it? I don't care how you feel about it. That may make me a horrible person. I don't care how you feel about it, because it's not a measure of its truth in whether or not it burns in your bosom. That's not what we're talking about. When I come back to somebody having to fly a plane, they have to deal with reality, right? It doesn't matter what altitude they feel that they're at. It matters what altitude they're at. It doesn't matter where they feel that the mountain is at, right? They can have all the good feelings in the world that they know where the, the airport is, but if the airport's not there, they've got a problem. We as believers have to do the same thing. In churches, we can do things because they feel good. We can do things because we think that it, we always got to come back. Come back to our truth just like them. And I'm going to say it just like, uh, we, and we have no excuse because we do know. While they may be searching and minus those who do not know Jesus, we know where we can find the answers. And we don't do it. Folks, we can, we can learn from the Bible. We can learn. And how else should we learn in community? It's a soft commercial for home groups. If you have a home group, that's a good place. What's a home group? Well. That's a soft one. I'm not going to go any deeper than that. But I'm going to close in prayer. We'll close in prayer, then we'll take our offering. Folks, if we're going to do an offering at the end, it's primarily for folks that are, that are part of this church. That if you want to contribute, you absolutely can. But what it is, is uh, we have, in the back of the chairs in front of you, we have like little family sharing cards. Or anything. If there's something that you want to, to let us know, be your prayer partners or a commitment that you want to do, fill it out, drop it in, that's great. Right. Um, I normally say, hey, we have water, we can do baptism for right now. This week, but next week, we'll have water ready to go. So if I have, I'll get it. I'll make sure it's right. Rob, you work too hard this week. Right. So let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you found us, that you called us out of the world, where we were at, where we were sinners, where we were adulterers, where we were homosexual, where we were murderers, where we were gossips, where we were doing all those mean, horrible, rotten things. You found us. You called us. You cleansed us. And Lord, we are so humbled that you are now sending us as apostles out into the world with the good news that they don't have to, they don't have to live in their own stink. Lord, as I take that message out there, look, remind me every day that, first of all, that I do have a stink that I needed to take care of. Ooh, stink. In Jesus Christ. But Lord, that I can go out and be a message of hope for other people. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, I failed in so many ways. Lord, I give you thanks that my eternal destination is not based on my failure, but it's based on your sacrifice. Lord, I thank you for your for your death on the cross. 
Father God, I thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to draw me out of the world, to change me, to transform me, to empower me. Lord, I pray that as we go out this week that we can continue to be lights in this community. May we help people know you. May we be faithful apostles. We thank you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.